All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning and allowing me to stand before you all and uh, preach this morning's service. I want to thank also Pastor Shelley for giving me this opportunity to stand before uh, his, his congregation here as he's the under shepherd uh, enough to, uh, you know, have enough, uh, I would say, uh, boldness and enough confidence to allow me to stand before you all. He didn't have to do such a thing as that, but, you know, I really want to thank him and let him know I appreciate that as well, and you all for being here this morning. I was talking to Brother Nick. Uh, I think I let you guys off the hook because he actually had the time set for, you know, the fall. When you fall back, it was still set an hour behind still, or I guess I'll, however that goes. So I actually let you all off the hook because I could have preached a little bit longer. So <laughs> when I told him that, he ran and changed it really fast. Now I like, could have had some long preaching going on here, but it's all right, though. I'll, I'll stick to the script here. Uh, but uh, if you have your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 3, in Colossians chapter 3, if you look at verse 22, the Bible says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And the title of my message actually comes from verse 22, where he says, not with eye service as men pleasers. The title of my message this morning is men pleasers, men pleasers. And, you know, today we rarely use this word men pleasers, right? We usually use the word people pleasers. That's what we use today. But going off a of biblical word, we developed that word people pleasers from this word here that says men pleasers. And, you know, we're going to look at this word men pleasers from two, from two angles. Because actually there is something wrong with being a man pleaser. But at the same time, it's nothing wrong with being a man pleaser where we should be a man pleaser. Right. So it just depends on that content or I would say the context, excuse me, the context of what that word is being used in. It can be used in a negative light, a negative connotation, or it can be used in a positive connotation. So we're going to look at them both from uh, both angles in the positive and in, in a negative light of being a men pleaser. So if you can, uh, we'll come back here, but you can turn with me to Galatians chapter one. In Galatians chapter 1, we're going to find our first point. Well, let's look at this first in a negative light, how it's a bad thing to be a man pleaser or a people pleaser. And this is something that we all should, you know, be careful about because no matter how much soul winning you do, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how much Bible you know, everyone can fall into this sin of being a man pleaser. And we're going to get into this later on. I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we'll see where even saved people, as we're going to see in the scriptures, can fall into the sin of being a man pleaser, a people pleaser. So for one, the first uh, point that we're going to look at is that man pleasers are not servants of Christ. Man pleasers are not servants of Christ. If you're there in Galatians chapter 1, Look at verse 8. The Bible says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Notice these words. For if I yet please men... I should not be the servant of Christ. And as I mentioned with this point here, men servants are not servants of Christ. OK. And by default, by default, if you are serving men, you cannot serve Christ. Right. This is what we're seeing from the scripture. Paul here is asking a question here. And of course, we know the answer. He said, for do I now persuade men or God? Well, of course, he's here for the work of the ministry. He's here to please God. But then he says, or do I seek to please men? And then he says, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So by default, when you are a man pleaser, 
I don't care what that type of service is. I don't care if you're going out so winning. I don't care if you're reading Bible. I don't care if you're showing up to church. If you are doing it with the intent of I really want to do this so people can see me, you're really not serving Christ. You are really serving yourself. You are really serving man. That is what we see. So therefore, although it may look on the outside that, hey, I'm doing this for Christ, where you inwardly know why you are doing it, here it is. You're not being a servant of Christ. So by default, if you are looking to serve men, you're not a servant of Christ. Now, let's get this understanding. This is not to say that this person is not saved. Let's get that understanding. Just because a person is caught up in being a man pleaser at that time does not mean that they are not saved. It just means that in that very act of service, they are not serving Christ. If that makes sense, they're not serving Christ. That person very well is saved, but their intents, their motives is wrong. So as I mentioned, just because a person is caught up in being a man pleaser doesn't mean that they're not saved. They're just not serving Christ at that hour. Let's see this in scripture. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 12. In the Gospel of John, chapter 12, we're going to see where there are saved people, saved individuals who showed up to hear the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ was there when he was there preaching, was there to see all his miracles. Yet they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they were men pleasers. They did not seek the praises of God, but they sought the glory and the praise of men. If you're there in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, look at verse 41. He says, these things said his eyes when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, notice these words among the chief rulers. Also, many believed on him. Well, believed on who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says many. Excuse me. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Notice these words, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So do we see that in verse 42, before we even recognize that these men really have the Pharisees in the back of their mind, they really have it in their heart that they want to please the Pharisees. They don't want to be put out of the synagogue. We see that first before any of that, that these people are actually saved. Because verse 42 says, many believed on him. He's talking about of these people who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the same people. Notice in verse 42, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So what were they concerned? Their concern is that, hey, I got to be in the synagogue. I, I want to be there when the scriptures are read. Uh, and, and because of that, I, I cannot confess Christ openly. I can't be, you know, caught up in, in so much of Christ's movement. I had to stay at a distance because of the Pharisees, because I don't want to be put out of the synagogue. And then he says, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And what we see is that saved people can be caught up in being a man pleaser. And we see that in the scripture where these people believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, yet they wanted to please men. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Turn to Philippians chapter one. What we see is that these people here, although they were saved, they just had ill motives. They had bad motives. And you know what saved people can do? Have bad motives. They can outwardly look as though they're looking to serve Christ, but inwardly they just have bad motives. Can they be saved? Absolutely, yes. Have they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely, yes. But they are doing what they're doing for all the wrong reasons. Very well saved, but just caught up in bad motives, ill motives. Let's see an example of this. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And look at verse 12. He says, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So what Paul is saying here, he's writing to the church of Philippi and he's saying, don't get this thing twisted. 
that because I'm in bonds thinking that this is all just going for the bad, something must be going on wrong. No, he's saying this is actually working out for the good. This is actually working out for the furtherance of the gospel. More people are getting saved, although he's still in bonds. It's not like the word of God is bound. The word is still going forth. Paul is still in ministry. So he's saying, don't think that this is happening for the worst. But he said that this is, uh, he said uh, that it has fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifested in all the palace and in all other places. And notice these words. And many of the brethren. What is that talking about? A saved individual. Yeah. Many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's saying there were saved individuals who could preach the word of God. But the thing is, they were not so so adamant about preaching because they were fearful. But when they heard about Paul and his tribulations and his afflictions, they began to wax bold. They began to wax confident because they're saying if this man can do all this and still be in prison and still do the work of God and do so much in ministry and suffer so many afflictions, we who are being free, we who are not locked up, obviously we can do something. So the thing is, they are not bound, but yet Paul is and they're gaining confidence. They are waxing bold off of what Paul is doing. But remember, he says many of the brethren in the Lord, these are saved people. But then we get to their motives. Notice what he says in verse 15. Some, well, who is some? The brethren. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And some also of goodwill. So we have two scenarios here. We have two situations. We have some who are preaching Christ. Yeah, on an outward appearance, they're preaching, they're opening up those scriptures, and they're letting it loose. But yet, what is their motives on the inside? Envy and strife. And then some, so Paul said, they're envious of me. That's what he's saying. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So you got some who are actually saved, and they're doing it for the right reasons. But then notice what he says. The one, who? The brethren. The one preached Christ of contentions, of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So what he's saying, it, there is one who is preaching Christ, but it's not sincere. The word of God just has power by itself. But inwardly, that guy is not sincere. Well, what is it when he says he's, he's not sincere? He's fake. It's a fake. It's a show. But then he says, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So Paul is already going through, but this guy is really looking, although he's saved, he's really looking to add afflictions to his brother Paul more than he has laid on him already. He's suffering already, and then he says, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. I mean, to be going through it already... And to receive persecution from the outside, you expect that. But you don't expect it to come from amongst your own brethren, right? right? He says, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. There's, there's the brethren also who know why I'm out here. They know that I am set for the defense of the gospel. But then he says, what then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So he's saying, in other words, he's saying it doesn't matter what their motive is. He's saying, I don't care. He said, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth. Well, you say, well, what does the word pretense mean? It means a fake. It means not sincere. So he says, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. He's saying, well, however their motive is, as long as Christ is getting preached, he says, and I therein do rejoice and yea, excuse me, yea, and will rejoice. He said, it doesn't matter what their motive is. Listen, as long as they preach Christ, I'm fine with that. They have issues with me. Okay, but preach the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's fine. But the main thing that we see is that ill motives from saved individuals. What saved individuals can be on the outside, it looks from the outside is that they're doing everything that they're doing for Christ. But inwardly, we see that saved people can be men pleasers. We see that saved people can be preaching for contentions and stripes and have all the wrong reasons. And as I mentioned, as saved individuals, we can fall into this. We see what he's saying. Many of the brethren in the Lord, they're preaching of envy and strife and contention. 
We don't want to be found out to be people who are doing what we're doing really for all the wrong reasons. You just think about this where you ask a question. You don't have to answer this out loud, of course. You just reason within yourself. Then why do you go soul winning? Is it an outward appearance? Why do you really show up three times after week? Why do you do you really do that because you have a sincere desire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it an outward appearance to show that, hey, I'm really doing this because I want to be here. I want to be here for Christ. But inwardly, you're just saying, oh, man, I'd rather be home. But I have to show everyone else that I'm godly. I have to show everyone else that I'm really all in it and, and, and in the IFV. I really have to show that. Well, you need to check your motives. Why do you do what you do? Why do you really read your Bible as much as you do? Is it because you want to be contentious? Is it because you really want to be out there just, you know, just laying it on everybody who try to rise up against you? You know what? Are you really doing it for the right reasons? The clothing you wear. Is that the clothing you really want to wear? The dresses. Do you really, really want to wear the dresses or is it an outward show? Is it really to, to give the, the or seek the praise of men? Or do you honestly want to do it because a woman should not wear that which pertain to a man? Men, why do you wear the clothing that you do? Do you really want to sag your pants? Do you really want to wear all the cut fitted shirts? Why, why do you do what you do? It, it's because your clothing ought to be modest as well. Why do you do what you do? Is it because you sincerely want to serve Christ or are you looking to be a man pleaser? Number one, men servants, excuse me, man pleasers, excuse me, man pleasers, number one, are not servants of Christ. That doesn't mean that they're not saved. It just means in that very act of service, you're not looking to serve God. You're looking for the praise of men. So number one, men pleasers are not servants of Christ. Number two, men pleasers are not sincere. Men pleasers are not sincere. Turn to um, Acts chapter 21. Men pleasers are not sincere. You say, what do you mean not sincere? Where they're fake. They, they, they're not saying <laughs> it is not to say that this person is fake in, in every area of their life, but in that act of service, they're fake. Men pleasers are not sincere. It means that they're fake. They're not real. In Acts chapter 21, we have Paul here who has went back to Jerusalem. Paul here. Is, is, is if you ask me, I believe Paul is in a, a, a sin right now. If you get all the scriptures leading up to this, Paul is somewhere where he's not supposed to be. The Lord has told him many times by different people through the power of the Holy Ghost, do not go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. And when he comes to Philip the Evangelist's house, we have a prophet that comes from Jerusalem and take Paul's garments and he uses it as an illustration and he's saying, hey, he binds his uh, his hands and feet together. He said, so shall it, be, shall it be done to the man who uh, owns these garments. I may have butchered that a, a little bit. Sorry. But he's basically saying this is what's going to happen to the man who owns these garments. Well, it was Paul's garments. So what he was showing Paul is that you're going to be captured. You're going to be put in prison. So the Lord did not want Paul to go back to uh, to Jerusalem. But Paul just insists in his own desire and jealousy to go back to Jerusalem. And when he's there in Jerusalem, he finds himself being fake. He finds himself not being sincere. You said, well, I don't understand that. How can that be? Well, notice verse 21, excuse me, verse 20. If you're in Acts chapter 20, notice the Bible. Paul here, the previous verses, he's given them a testimony about the great things that God has wrought among, uh, among the Gentiles, how many of them have gotten saved. And this is James that is speaking to him. Verse 20 says, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children. 
neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. And notice these words, all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no, no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So I know that's a lot that's going on right there. But what happens is Paul goes back and he tells James and the brethren what good things God has done among the Gentiles. And they're saying, great, great, great. But we got a bigger issue here. There's, they're saying, he's saying, the Jews know that you're here, Paul. And they have heard about you basically teaching against circumcision. See, Paul has went out and said, listen, salvation is not a circumcision. If ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's been teaching that salvation is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's been many other people who tried to come and insert circumcision as well. And Paul has been preaching faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now that he's come back to Jerusalem, James is telling like, listen, they know what you've been preaching. And now you need to basically shave your head with these other men who are under this vow to make it seem like that those things that you've been teaching are really not true, that they just been hearing those words. And now that you're here, this is the proof. Look at my head. Look at my shaved head. I'm just like you. So what does Paul do? Well, verse 24 says that, um, uh, I'm sorry, it was verse uh, 26. Then Paul took the men and the next day purified himself with them. So he go and shaves his head. And, and the truth is, these men are under this, uh, they're, they're under this charge. But is Paul really under this charge? No, he's not. So what is Paul really doing? He's being a fake. Well, what we see is two different people trying to be men pleasers. James is trying to please the Jews and Paul is trying to please the Jews and James. So we see saved individuals just fall into just being a man pleaser, but not only that, just being fake at the same time. Paul here, because he's looking to please the Jews, he finds himself being a fake. And, you know, being a fake, it will lead you not only just being fake in that situation, not only just being insincere in that situation, but then it will lead you into further sin. Because Paul here thought that, well, if I just actually just shave my head, it would be OK. If you read the rest of the story, it wasn't OK. They actually beat him pretty bad, left him nearly dead. They had to carry him into the judgment hall. But the thing is, is that he was led into further sin as well because he was being fake. You say, well, where do you see that at? Well, notice verse 26. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of days of purification. Notice this. Until then, an offering should be offered for every one of them. Now, wait a minute. An offering? I thought Jesus Christ, according to... John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Hey, once Jesus Christ was sacrificed for our sins, there was no more offerings to be made. So James here is going to offer up an offering for these guys. But, but wait a minute. This is the New Testament in his blood. We don't need any more offerings. But we see when you're fake, when you're not being sincere, you get led away and just what they say, sin to take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. We see this is a situation right here where he's just taken into a sin where they're offering sacrifices now, making offerings. We don't want to be led away with just being a man pleaser. Everybody 
can have a tendency to be a man pleaser. And you know what? It'll lead you into further sin. Sins that you don't even know is a sin. We have to be cautious about that. Not only that, but turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. We don't also, because of being a man pleaser, we don't want to carry the same characteristics as those who are damned to hell. Does that make sense? Those who are damned to hell were known as hypocrites. They were known as men pleasers. They were known to be fake. So we don't want to be as saved individuals in that same category with those who are condemned to hell. See, praise God, because we are saved, we would never know what the second death tastes like. We would never know what that feels like because we have passed from death unto life. So we would never suffer a second in hell. Jesus Christ has paid the price and suffered for our sins in hell. So we would never taste of that at all. But we don't want to carry the same characteristics and traits as those people who are condemned to hell. You say, well, what are you talking about? We're here in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23. This is one of my favorite chapters and one of the favorite uh, you know, passages of Scripture to see Jesus Christ just preaching. This whole chapter right here is just lethal. And he's just just going in pretty hard on the Pharisees. He's calling them vipers. He's calling them serpents. He's just going on and on. But notice what he says here in uh, chapter 23, Matthew 23, look at verse 13. He says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Well, what's a hypocrite? Somebody who says something, but they don't do it. Somebody who's a fake. These guys would lay the law heavy and would not lift uh, with their finger, not, not a single commandment or so to do it themselves. He says here, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses. And notice this word. Does this sound familiar? And for a pretense, make long prayer. Well, didn't we see that word pretense with Paul when he says the brethren in the Lord? Saved individuals, he said, whether they preach, whether in pretense, what is he talking about? Not sincere, whether it's fake. So these guys here, Jesus says here in verse 14, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, for a fake, for a show, is what he's saying, make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land, and to make one proselyte, proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. These people are condemned to hell. They're hypocrites. They, they are fake. They do what they do for a show. They're on their way to hell. But why should saved individuals carry these same traits here? We shouldn't be known. And as I mentioned, I don't want to be the dead horse. Saved individuals can fall into being a hypocrite. Saved individuals can fall into being fake, having a pretense. But this was, hey, he said this about the Pharisees. We don't want to be known to be known as a Pharisee. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Second Chronicles chapter 24. <clears throat> Men pleasers, number one, are not servants of Christ. Number two, men pleasers are not sincere. Number three, men pleasers are not loyal. Men pleasers are not loyal. Eventually, they burn out. Eventually, they quit. Why? Because they're not doing what they're doing for the right reasons. So eventually they, they just flake out. They can't handle it. Men pleasers are not loyal. Notice the Bible here says in verse 1, 2 Chronicles chapter 24, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zabiah of Beersheba. 
and Joash, notice these words, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So you look at this, you say, well, hey, this guy Joash, he, he, was, he was a great king. Anytime you see in the Bible, in the Kings or the Chronicles, when it say that this man did was right in the eyes of the Lord, hey, that means he was a good king. But wait a minute. Was this man Joash, was he a good king because he just had it in his heart to be a good king? Well, the answer is no. But notice this. The Bible said in verse 2, And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Stay in that same chapter. Look at verse 17. Notice what happens. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the prince of Judah and made obeisance to the king, then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Back up to verse 15. I jumped in too, early, too late, sorry. Verse 15 says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, and hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his, uh, toward his house. It says, Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah, and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for their trespass. So wait a minute. If you paid attention there, you'll see that when Jehoiada is alive, the beginning of the chapter speaks about Joash, how he becomes king at age seven. And you have to understand logically at age seven as a king, a kid will not make sound decisions. A king was made in Israel. They wanted a king that will go in and out of battle. You can't expect that from a seven year old, right? You can't expect him to have wise counsel at age seven. So Jehoiada here is one who was pretty much his counselor. He was one that would stand over here, over him and make the decisions for them, uh, for him and lead him in, in a path that was righteous. But when he dies, we see that these men come up to Joash and clearly what it's about is them leaving the Lord and then worshiping idols. That's what it's about. And back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, the Lord gave a death sentence on this, that if someone was to come and try to entice you, it didn't matter if it was your family member that said, let us leave the Lord and go and worship idols. The Lord said that you all ought to put him to death. Don't have mercy on him or her. If they want to make you go off and serve idols, that was the death penalty. So these men here ought to receive the death penalty from Joash. But Joash here, he's not loyal. He, he, he flakes out because when his spiritual leader is gone, who is Jehoiada, the priest, when he's gone, he no longer is serving the Lord. So you have to ask the question, well, Joash, why were you really doing what, what you were doing? Because as long as Jehoiada, the priest, was there, what did he do? He served the Lord. But the moment Jehoiada died, he go off to serving idols. So what or who were you really serving? Joash was not really serving the Lord. So really, you have to ask the question, Joash, were you really loyal to the Lord? No, he was not. Who was he being loyal to? His spiritual leader. Jehoiada is who he was being, uh, who he was being uh, subject to. He was being obedient unto Jehoiada, but he was not in it for the long haul. He was not in it for the right reasons. And that was proved when these men came and just basically just convinced him to go off and serve the Lord. And it was quick. You know, he didn't, he didn't say, hey, get out of here. I mean, he just, okay, let's go and do it. But not only is he not loyal to the Lord, but also if you go to chapter 23, actually 22, I'm sorry. He's not loyal to Jehoiada as well. See, it was Jehoiada's wife. There's this wicked woman, Athaliah, who raises up and she puts all the seed royal, all the kids to death of the king. And Jehoiada's wife 
ended up saving the life of Joash as a baby. And you would think that, hey, you know what? He, uh, he ought to be loyal and show some loyalty to that man who saved his life, right? Well, notice what, it, what happens in chapter 22, Chronicles. Look at verse, um, verse 10, chapter 22, verse 10. But when Athaliah, the mother of Haziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Haziah, and stole him from among the king's sons that were slain and put him and his nurse in the bedchamber. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, notice this, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Haziah, hid him from Athaliah, so that she slew him not. And he was with them, hid in the house of God six years, and Athaliah reigned over the land. So turn back to chapter 24. You would think that, hey, Jehoiada saved your life as a baby. You ought to do him good, right? But notice chapter 24, and look at verse, verse 20. It says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And notice this, and they, this is Jehoiada's son. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Well, who's the king right now? Joash. So Joash is the king, and he commands them to kill Jehoiada's son. Jehoiada is the one who spared your life, and this is how you pay Jehoiada back. You go ahead and kill his son. Verse 22 says, Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, the Lord, look upon it and require it. We see that this man, Joash, although he's a king, he's not loyal. And that's what men pleasers are. They're not loyal. He was not loyal to God, nor was he loyal and showed appreciation to Jehoiada, who saved his life as a young man. Men pleasers have a tendency to just flake out. When they're in it for the wrong reasons, you know what? They just eventually just burn out. What we can take here as an application is that Joash, when his spiritual leader falls off the map, he also falls off the map. That's what we see. When his spiritual leader, who was doing the counseling for him, who was making godly decisions for him, when he was no longer on the scene, when he passed away, guess what Joash did? He passed away as well. And we ought to be careful about our spiritual leadership. I believe in following spiritual leadership as long as they follow the Lord. Amen. That is what we should do. But the moment a spiritual leader falls off the map, that doesn't mean that you have to fall off the map. We can use a good example of, of Elijah and Elijah. Elijah, Elisha is there doing the ministry of Elijah, and he's there pouring water on his hand. But there came a time when Elijah was going to be taken up to heaven. And we don't see Elisha just saying, well, I don't want anything to do with God anymore. What does he do? He actually picks up that same mantle with a double portion of the spirit, and he continues to fight. He go on to do greater miracles than Elisha did, than Elijah did. But we see that just because his spiritual leader is no longer there, we don't see that he just flakes out on God. And we see this all the time where people, you can go out so in to speak to many people who will say, oh, yeah, I used to be in church, but then my pastor, he did this, you know, brother such and such did this, and I'm no longer in church. Well, is that what it took to get you out of church? I'm not saying that if a, if a pastor, listen, pastors are, are but men. They are human as well. They can make mistakes. But I'm not saying if the pastor falls in any type of sin that you have to stay at that church. You can go to another church. But the thing is, don't just flake out on God like Joash did. Joash is not even serving God anymore. He's going off to serve idols. And you have people who just throw in the towel on God. Oh, I don't believe in God anymore. Why? Oh, because these Christians at the church, they were just hypocrites. Oh, my pastor, he did this and that, and, and I don't want to follow God anymore. Well, who were you really following?
Having spiritual leadership like Joash had is good. But when the spiritual leadership fall off or pass away, that doesn't mean that you have to fall away. You just like Elijah, pick up that mantle and do great things for God and so on. Man pleasers, number one, are not servants of Christ. Man pleasers are not sincere. Man pleasers, number three, are not loyal. Number four, man pleasers are not getting rewarded. Matthew chapter 6. Man pleasers are not getting rewarded. I won't spend too much time on, on this point here. But verse 1, the Bible says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men. Well, what are alms? Just, uh, I think the best example is the, the man who was uh, paralyzed at the gate called beautiful at the temple. Uh, he sought alms of John and Peter, right? Uh, that man could not provide for himself. So alms is basically being able to help those who are not in a position to help themselves. Jesus says here, take heed that ye do not your alms before men. To be seen of them. Doesn't that sound like a man pleaser? To be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Now, notice this. He's talking to saved individuals. How do we know that? Because he said, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. So he's talking to saved individuals, which means that saved individuals can miss out on rewards when they're being men pleasers. And men pleasers are not getting rewarded this is what he's saying take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them otherwise ye have no reward of your father which is in heaven therefore when thou doest thine arms do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men verily i say unto you they have their reward and what's their reward the fact that men oh man this guy is so godly. This man, let's give him a hand clap of praise around here. You know, when, when you have, when that is what you're seeking, you know what? You have your reward. The praise that those men are giving you, that's your reward. I believe that the reward that God will give is way better than that hand clap of praise right there. So we don't want to lose out on that. The Bible says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Well, that judgment seat of Christ, that's not to determine whether we are going to hell or heaven. That's been settled already when we place our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is a judgment where you are just judged on your uh, on your deeds and your actions and to receive those rewards for the things that you did after you got saved. Praise God for that. But we don't want to be losing out on rewards because we were seeking the praise and glory of men. We don't want that. So let's look at being a man pleaser. Let's look at it in a positive light now because we've been looking at it in a negative light that we see man pleasers are not servants of Christ. Uh, they're not sincere. They're not loyal and, and they're not getting rewarded as well. You receive your reward from those men who you're trying to please. But then let's look at it in a in a positive light. Right. In a positive connotation, because just as I mentioned, by default, when you're looking to serve men, by default, you're not serving Christ. But on the contrary, by default, when you serve God, you will find yourself being a man pleaser. Does that make sense? When you serve God, you will find yourself pleasing men. It happens that way because when Jesus, matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said himself that he came not to minister. Uh, he came not to be ministered to, but to minister. And how was his ministry? Well, serving others. Right. So when you have it in your heart to serve God, you will find yourself serving man, pleasing men. So in what ways can we look to please men? Number one, please men with the gospel. I know this is nothing new to this church. This is the best that we can do right here. Please men with the gospel. First Corinthians chapter nine. See, when you serve God, when you follow Christ, you know what that'll make you a fisher of men. And by default, as I say, when you look to please God, 
these are one of the, the uh, one of the things that will follow that you just have it out to see, save, uh, see, excuse me. You just have it out to see people saved when you follow the Lord. It is in your heart. It burdens you when you're following God. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 16 says, for though I preach the gospel. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He's saying a dispensation is committed unto me. He's saying a charge. If I find myself not wanting to do this, he said, in spite of that, there is a dispensation, a charge that is committed unto me. I have to preach the gospel is what he's saying. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, one chapter over. Look at verse 31. He says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. We see here that when it comes to being a man pleaser in, in a good way, that when you're looking to serve God, one of the first uh, traits that you come across is that somebody who is looking to seek and save that which was lost. And we see that in here in Paul's ministry where he's calling that out. And that's the best thing that we can do as a man pleaser. You want to please somebody out there? This is the first thing we can do. Hey, you know what? Ask them about salvation. Question their salvation. Lead them down the Romans road. Lead them through the Bible way to heaven throughout the Bible and give them a chance to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the best thing that we can do when it comes to pleasing men. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And these will be pretty quick, these points here. Ephesians chapter 6. Not only looking to please men with the gospel, but looking to please men in our labor. And our daily work, when we go to work, looking to please men in our labor. I'll quote to you Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Notice those words. And to please them well. Who? Their master. Well, who is the master? Their master according to the flesh. Talking about your boss. Talking about your manager. He says, is all servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Hey, when we please men, when we look to please men in our labors, you know what? Hey, they don't have a reason to blaspheme that holy name. They don't have a reason to mock at the things of God. Why? Because you are setting forth an example and you are a good laborer. You are a good worker. For that, uh, for that manager, for that, uh, that owner or so. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service, here's it, here it is again, as men pleasers. Not with eye service as men pleasers. Not just working when, when the, the boss's eyes just on you. You know, everybody just look busy when, but soon as hey man, let me... You know, get on my phone, kind of, and then when you go, you know, that's, that's a man pleaser. We, that's, that's working with eye service. So we don't want to be found to be doing that, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. And look at that. Notice how he tied in, but as the servants of Christ, because when you serve Christ, you'll find yourself 
just serving men, being a man pleaser. Amen. How about looking to please men when it comes to just our fellow neighbor? Turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And while you turn there, I'll quote Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at that. He's saying, listen, don't esteem yourself above others. Hey, esteem others better than themselves. Esteem others better than you is what he's saying here. Look not every man on his own things. This just reminds me of the generation that we in. I don't know how long this generation going to last. The selfie generation, as they call it. You know, all these selfies and everything. Everybody's just self, 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 self. They, it's just all about me, me, me. Well, here, this scripture here is saying, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Just looking to please your fellow neighbor, looking to be a blessing to someone else. Look at uh, Romans chapter 15. This will be the last place we'll turn. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. There it is. Not to please ourselves. He said, but bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And I think he's using the best example that we could use in our life to be a man pleaser and to please our fellow neighbors and just mankind in general, the Lord Jesus Christ. How the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, although he was rich, he said, for our sake, he became poor. You know, and Christ was looking not on his on the things of himself, but looking out for the good of others. And basically, he's the example that we could use when it comes to being a man pleaser. That listen, if we're gonna please men, let's do it in the right, you know, in the right context. As I mentioned, you know, being a man pleaser, there's nothing wrong with it, but there is something wrong with being a man pleaser. Right. It just depends on that context that you're putting it in. All those that we listed first about being a man pleaser in the negative light, and we've seen the Pharisees and how we don't want to be in the same characteristic traits as them, and we don't want to be found out to be fake and insincere, we should avoid those things. And because we've seen in the Bible that saved people can fall into being a man pleaser, it's something that we should avoid. But we also should be a man pleaser concerning the fact that if we serve Jesus Christ, we will look out on the interests of others and look to please men in that uh, in that factor of things. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you um, this morning for your word. Thank you for helping me to uh, preach this message, Lord. I pray that the church was edified this day. Bless us this um, evening as we go soul winning and the uh, evening service as well. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.